Matty, Brian, this is going to be great. So we're going to start with a bit of a founder's story and about how you guys connected. And then we'll talk a bit about what Matty, what you guys and the team are building right now. And then we're going to kind of look out to the future a little bit. Perfect. Eleven Labs, you know, I'm based in London. Eleven Labs is a seriously hot property. You've raised over 100 million US dollars. You're worth well over a billion. So you're firmly in unicorn status. Backers, of course, including A16Z, but also Sequoia founders of Oculus, IG, Instagram, and plenty of others. Let's start with what gave you, what was the germ that seeded Eleven Labs as an idea? Take us back to that, you and your partner, Piotr. Thank you, and, and f f pleasure, pleasure being here. Um, so Eleven Labs, as Tom mentioned, we, we are working across audio space, both on the research and the product side, trying to make content universally accessible across voices, sounds, and languages. I'm in a very lucky position where I've met my co-founder, Piotr, 14 years ago, back in Poland. We went to the same high school, took all the same classes together, uh, then through the years got to study, work, travel together, now co-founded 11 Labs together and still best friends. Um, but one of the ideas and, and how it sparked came from where you're from, from Poland. And there is a very peculiar thing that if you, if you watch a foreign movie in a Polish language, uh, all the voices, both male and female voices, are narrated with just one single character. So you have just one narration across the entire content. And as you can imagine, the experience is, is very subpar. All the original emotions and tonation, the voices, the creativity disappears. Um, and this is something that we would love to change with Eleven Labs. And uh, as you think about the future and the next, next few years, you'll be able to enjoy all the content, all the communication, across the languages, but preserving that original, that original um, um, uh, uh, creativity. And, and that's what sparked 11 Labs and, of course, expanded to everything audio over time. Everything audio, and it includes audio books, includes text to audio, it includes synthesizing voices, you've got a voice library, you've got multiple different, different products at play here, and you're, you're building out and shipping quite quickly. Uh, Brian, what, what did you, when did you first become aware of 11 Labs, Matty and Piotr, the team, and what, what drew you to them? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to think about. The audio as a modality was always very interesting to us. If you think about how communication happened, even before written language, it was always audio, which uh, I have like a couple companies, including we backed also a Clubhouse of the World. So the audio as a genre and audio as a modality was very important to us. And then back the clock, I don't know, like a year and a half ago, a little more than like a year and a half ago, ChatGPT came out, what, three, four months ago. And we had the theory, okay, Maybe there's this category of LLM mother models that do really well. But hey, maybe each modality, audio, image, video, 3D, world, what have you, will have its own winners. And us as a company and firm, uh, we should be looking for winners into each category. So audio was something very close, uh, near and dear to our heart. And, and so we started working. We started meeting all the companies in the audio space and some of the competitors who are you know, out there, and uh, we met Matty, uh, call it what, like February, Mar uh, January, February last year. And then this is after we have done the work. We understood the space, we understood like the team out there, we understood some of the technical, you know, approaches, and you know, we hadn't made an investment because nothing quite, you know, sparked it. And then when we met Matty, and he sort of shared his story, and I grew up in Korea where I still remember 25, 30 years ago, Legend of the Fall, Brad Pitt, in female Korean voice actor. I'm like, this is, just, <laughs> this is rough. And it's telling you the story of how that will change and something sparked in us. Well, like maybe this is the way that the Tower of Babel comes down. And this is how AI and audio really changes the world. And we saw a deep technical and product acumen in the team and the combination of the team. And we decided then and there that uh, it was the team that we wanted to back. And so, you know, through a process, we, we were courting Matty and, and a team, and we had our last call at 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific time, based mm -hmm. in SF, and we asked the question that we always ask, are we your first choice? And usually what we want to hear is like, we love you, yes, we want to work together, blah, blah, blah. Matty said, yeah, 
we, we like you. <laughs> and we're like, uh-oh. Like, uh, one of the things that we say internally at A16Z, if we're not winning, we're losing. So, oh shit, we're losing. All right. So I pack my bag in five minutes. There's a flight out from SF to London at 10.30, leaving, departing at 10.30. So this is 9.05 now. And I call my assistant in Uber and say, book me that flight. And she's like, it's too late, I don't know. I'm like, I don't care, get me on that flight. So I get on the flight somehow, and the team that I'm working with also, they're coordinating on the ground, so I think we made a presentation while I was flying, I was coordinating with you, like, where can we meet? And I was in London for all of four hours, of which two hours were spent from Heathrow to Notting Hill. <laughs> and uh, we, we met at Electric House in Soho and uh, had a good chat and was able to scribble something down in a piece of paper, took a picture, and that was it. And I went back and went back to the offsite in Las Vegas. And the next day, Silicon Valley Bank came down. So, <laughs> yeah, story. wow, wow, the timing around that. Timing Matty, around that. Matty, were you just playing hard to get? I mean, you didn't, <laughs> you were being caught. This is the point. You were at a point where you were being courted. You, don't, you weren't having to pitch this to investors. You had Sequoia knocking on your door. You had multiple investors knocking on your door. And then you had A16Z. You were playing hard to get. But, yes, the quick answer is we were just playing hard to get. And, and to correct the record, we do love A16Z. They are, they are, they are phenomenal you do partners. do now. Yeah, yeah Always. No, we do. <laughs> um, Brian, I want to put a pin in something that you touched on, which is that you saw in this team product but engineering as well. So yeah. Piotr coming from the Google learning, yeah. machine learning side, and of course, Matty coming originally from Palantir on the product side. Talk to us about the importance of that combination and whether it's rare or not. So two, two things. I, yeah. I used to work at Snapchat, where uh, Snap's founders, Evan Spiegel, Bobby Murphy, they're best friends, they're very, very close. And I've, saw, I've seen that dynamic of how that works. Like a CEO who's very product focused and CTO wants to focus on the background and like really think about the deep questions in the future problems and how that combo works really well. I think the other thing that I really loved about the combination of uh, Matthew and Piotr was um, there's a concept that I, it's a strange concept, I call it gummy bear founders. Uh, and the gummy bear is a theory where, you know, if you think about, you know, your vitamin C, whoever came up with the vitamin C first, so they came up with this large brown pill that was hard to swallow and it's great and you should take it, but it's hard to swallow. And some enterprising person looked at that and I'm like, oh, people don't like this thing. Uh, I'm like, I want my kids to take it, what do I do? I know, I'm gonna put in a gummy bear. And that person is someone who understands the product and technical difficulties of building something like that and the value of it, but also really understand customers and say, how do I actually combine this to actually deliver to the customers? And sometimes that's found in one person, but most of the times it's not. And it's very rare to find a combination like Piotr and Matti, who teams up in a perfect way that delivers that. Because in the age of AI, if you don't understand the underlying technical uh, you know, aspects of things or you know, want to build a state-of-the-art thing, it's actually quite difficult to build a product that people love and want to use and build upon. So I think that was a really big differentiation that Eleven Labs brought where, and I later learned that they were friends forever and they, like, I, I got to see them interact together. I almost like teared up, this is perfect, this is so cute, this is amazing. <laughs> and it's a team that has a fundamental trust that work together, build together, who knows how to divide the world of building the company together in a tech and product focused way. And I think that's, that was, that, that's been sort of an aha moment and magical moment for me. Matty, how did you leverage that when you were fundraising, maybe at the earlier stages when maybe it was a little bit more, more challenging? How did you leverage that skill set to try and get the term sheets that you and the team wanted? In general, I think the, one of the, the special things that we are very happy to be able to do at Eleven Labs is combine that research frontier, building the models, where Piot shines, assemble the team as a, an incredible brain to, to really push something that is impossible in the audio space, where the models actually sound like human voice, can replicate a lot of that nuance accurately. Um, and, um, and then beyond research, we, we layer that product element around it. And the layer uh, of the product part is, is crucial um, because we know that as we deploy the technology, a lot of people are still very new to the audio. They don't know how to use it. So we really need an easy interface for people to, uh, at scale, be able to, to understand how it works, show to the world the quality you can achieve, um, and 
by definition, help us with the distribution part. So while Piotr was working on the research side, what we are trying to do in parallel is figure out who are the first users and what is the first product. And uh, as, you, as you do in the early days, you try to call the email and call reach out to all possible users to, to try to understand their use cases before it's even ready. Um, and I remember this first uh, uh, indie book author that we reached out to, and we asked him to whether he would be interested in voicing his audiobook uh, with our technology. Our technology wasn't ready. It was this little box where you could input roughly 200 text characters at once and get the audio. And he was interested. He, uh, he then went back, copy-pasted his entire book into that little box, <laughs> uh, downloaded it, published it, it got good reviews, and came back with uh, three other people that wanted to voice audiobook as well. And that was like a signal, OK, we are onto something in that space. And then we followed that with other categories of, of, of use cases, working with creators and trying to get them on board. So when, when we started going um, into fundraising process, we, we knew what are the set of use cases that we, we can deliver. We continued with that self-serve motion of deploying the technology broadly to, to really understand the, the use cases, but also let the world tell the story that 11 Labs isn't just us saying that it's the best, but also our users can attest to that. Um, and, um, and those combination of those two was, was, was really helpful. And you get to the point where you've got the, mod you've got the model, you've done the testing, you've got funding. How do you chore choreograph the release of products? How do you think about how you time them? whether the quality is where you want it to be, the price point. How do you choreograph all of that? Yeah, the, so, so there's definitely a, 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 we don't always know is also the quick answer. Mm -hmm. But internally, the things that we will look into is, A, compare it, the quality of the model compared to other, other internal models we have the, the released. So this is usually done by human testing. We have people listening to samples and comparing, is it actually better? We work across 30 languages. So we try to test whether each of the languages is actually at the right level. We go through safety testing. Is it actually uh, 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 both say what you want to say? Um, uh, do we have the right mechanism to protect the, 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 the things that get generated? Um, and then as we think about packaging the product, uh, we of course layer in how will it actually work in the product sense? How will people interact with that technology? And that's usually a combination of us first trying a bet internally then releasing it to the first set of uh, uh, our alpha users. We have a few thousand alpha users that will help us refine the, the product itself. And then when we know it's ready, which is usually a set of weeks out from there, we'll release it to the world. Um, and that combination of those three, so is the quality out there? Is the safety at the right level? And do we know the product takes the right shape will be some of the key factors. And, and, and Brian, you bring experience. Obviously, you were at Snap previously, uh, pre-IPO as, as well. But you've also invested in, in foundation models like, like Mistral as well. So when you have conversations with Eleven Labs and other founders about how to prioritize, whether it's the focus on research or the focus on product, where, where does that advice come in? What kind of key takeaways can you give founders when they're thinking about those issues? So um, I know what I don't know. So I don't, I'm not qualified to comment on the quality of the models, mm. uh, which is why I partner up with our infra team to make sure there's a, there's a right part of advice or thinking on that. Where I focus more on is sort of go to market and how you know, we think about the release uh, you know, vectors, if you will. And uh, I think one of the interesting things that we see in the best founders, including of course, Matty and Peter, is uh, Piotr, is the velocity of shipping is quite important. And what I mean by that is that we can sit there and pontificate and think about theorizing, like, it's going to be used this way, it's going to be used that way. At the end of the day, like we, especially VCs, we don't know. And what we end up really doing is uh, focusing and helping, um, well, Maddie does all the hard work to say, oh, like maybe we actually step on the pedal to continue the velocity of shipping. And I think the teams that do that consistently are the ones that end up winning because uh, the technology changes so quickly now. So in order to stay ahead, if you don't actually ship quickly, you don't actually catch up or even like, lead that pack. Is there a tension there with quality? You need to hit, you're, you're putting pressure on the team, or at least your emphasis is on velocity, shipping. 
Is there a tension there when it comes to quality of the product? Yeah, of course. I think uh, the, the focus uh, that Matty has on the, the safety side and how yeah. to think about the product and how, how it's going to be used is a very, very important one for us. So it's an often a topic that we talk about at hours, for hours, at, at four meetings of how do we actually think people will use this, what is the right way to approach it, and actually being very thoughtful around that is very important. Mm. So it's a balance of everything, but again, like with a little bit of like touch of uh, emphasis on like we should still be shipping and putting uh, innovative, incredible state-of-the-art technologies out there for other companies to build upon. Uh, and Matt, Matt, your client, you're going to step in there, but I was going to get to enterprise. So, so, so step in, respond to what Brian's saying, and then we'll move on to the enterprise piece. I think the, uh, the, I think the one quick addition there is that um, I think the, what's special in the research space is that frequently uh, you, you cannot predict all the use cases that the users will actually work mm. with the, or create with the technology. So what the, the speed of iteration and actually working with that users helps you refine that product into something that will ultimately be what they, what they are interested in using. It's as true in 11 lab sense, but also ChatGPT, when that was released, it wasn't yet clear that this will be used at such scale. And, and only, only then it was like, OK, this is magic. This actually works. We can go, we can go quicker. So as we think about that iteration, it's, it's very much of like, A, how can we learn from the users as much as, as, as get it out to the market? And of course, the big part where a60Z, uh, but also the, the, the partners we have on board are super helpful is beyond the release itself is how do you, how do you get it to the world so they actually know that this even exists? And, uh, and whether this is paid marketing, affiliates, SEO optimization, um, the, all of those factors are crucial to, 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 not, uh, to not only release, but actually get other people to, to, to hear about it too. And then there's that feedback loop, obviously, when consumers and customers and clients start using it in different ways, maybe, and then you can feed that back in to the product itself. Talk to us. So you've got, you got the enterprise customer, you've got the hobbyist, you've got the consumer. Wh which part of that is the biggest revenue stream for you going forward? How do you balance the focus? Very different enterprise versus the consumer side. How do you balance that mix? The, that's a, that's, a, that's a, a tricky one, and we've started Initially, mostly on the, on the creator, prosumer, hobbyist side. So when we launched, very self-serve motion, a lot of subscriptions coming in. Um, and that's quickly, uh, slowly or quickly, is progressing towards enterprise. So now we are just a little bit over on the self-serve side, so a lot of the hobbyists and creators, um, um, roughly 70, 30 towards enterprise. And the enterprise is the one that's growing, growing the quickest. What's the interesting thing is that we are seeing even a lot of people in the, the business setting, in the enterprise setting, are looking for tools and an easy way to try them out and actually see, is this good enough? So they will usually start as your creators or as your developers using that subscription. Um, and only then, within the enterprise, they will say, OK, this is actually a good solution that we would like to use. Um, so in our sense, what we are trying to keep, which is a risky bet, is keep our technology very open so we can give it to everybody that really wants to benefit from the best of audio, whether it's creating and narrating an article, creating that book, turning one movie to another with another language, or creating dynamic character. We love the creators and developers as the first vector of iteration because they are quick. They show the world what's possible. We learn from them. Um, they learn from us uh, uh, on, on, on what we can ship and, and how we ship in what direction. Um, but that helps us with that distribution motion to then get us to the enterprise side. And of course, enterprise, very different uh, mechanics where we are optimizing for how can we make it a collaborative ecosystem for people to work together? How can we make it uh, uh, into a, a secure environment for you to really be able to upload your content and, and go at scale? Uh, the tricky mix for us is to figure out which of the product pieces we go deep into. Mm. As you go into enterprise, the initial layer is, uh, is, is, is frequently not enough. You need, to, you need to go a level deeper. So that's the, that's the usual challenge. And here we are waiting against, where do we think research is ready? Where do we know we can provide long-term value? And where there is market demand? And, and then go a little bit deeper. Yeah, that's deeper. really interesting. And the enterprise piece is growing faster at the moment, for, uh, at least. Brian, is your, is your bi given your background at Snap, is your bias towards the consumer as a, as a customer? How do you think about this so, dynamic? Two, two parts, actually, to, to that sort of question, and I'll veer a little differently. But one is, um, it's interesting. In the age of AI, we had, we had this discussion internally a ton. The division of consumer, business, prosumer, SMB was a spectrum 
And in the age of SaaS, SaaS, it was pretty clear. Like if you grow in a business, you go knock on the door of Univision and be like, I would like to talk to you. If in the consumer side or consumer, you just like try to go, you know, get the individuals to use it. I think in the age of AI, what we're seeing, especially similar to what Matty said, is that the differentiation is very unclear. An individual within a company can be using the product for work use case. And you frequently see that in the usage pattern. I'm like, oh, why is this person with like a personal email actually like using the hell out of it? Interesting. They must not be a regular consumer. So I think that division is becoming less clear where I think initially individuals, so whether it's consumer or business, SMB or consumer, it starts with an individual. And they're like, oh my God, this product is so good. And the reason is AI currently is magic. It's magic. It's like wishcraft. I can speak and it translates into Polish. Like what? Like almost instantaneous, like almost immediately, that, that's wishcraft. So the product is so good that individual will start to use it and that actually affects how organizations start to think about, oh, like maybe I, need, I have those use cases. And if a product is magical enough, they will use it and there's an important ingredient there where two, if the founders who are building the company wants to do that and do it in earnest and want to learn the enterprise go to market motion, it turns into that. And that actually becomes the thing that grows really well, which is very important. Now, the second point to the whole story is, Matthew's being very humble of like, oh, like we started up consumers and like prosumers and it's like now enterprise is quickly growing. Like I have not seen companies and founders who learn that motion and understand that in a way that the team here does. It's incredible. Like it really is like, I think Matthew is like one of the very, very, very few examples of someone who started with more of the consumer prosumer motion initially and figured out a way to actually go up market and actually sell into enterprise and actually build product that serves real use case at an institutional level. That is actually really, really rare. So I think two part point is yeah. that one, um, you know, I think there is no emphasis on the, we should do a consumer, we should do not because at the end of the day, it starts with individuals and mm. the, the, the value is shown through the product that is based on research. And then that gets distributed up into the organization where it doesn't work if the founders don't want to do that, right? But we have a team that wants to do that, do it in earnest and learn so, so quickly. And it's been incredibly inspirational to see the team were in Matthew specifically, like actually learn that motion and become an expert at that. So it's been, it's been incredible to watch. Matty, what is, what is your, what is your, who is your main competitive threat right now? Is, is OpenAI gonna kind of steamroll what you and others are trying to do in this space? The, um I, I, th this is an interesting, interesting one as, as we are kind of spanning that research and the product work. Uh, I think the, uh, from all the players, OpenAI is probably at the top of who we think and, and admire as, as an incredible company to, to, to what they build on the research side and, and the team they have assembled. And they're really pushing the research ahead. So yeah, as, you think, as, we, as you think about, uh, uh, as you think about the potential competition, they, they are the ones that, 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 um, that have proven that they can do it. Of course, there are others around the corner from Tropic, uh, with, with, with Gemini from Google, and, and other big incumbents who are also having that, that big research element. Still, I think the main thing that, uh, that we think the space will evolve to, and, and what we are betting on on Eleven Labs, is really focusing on this one domain, the one modality of audio. We are building the research and all our expertise, the team on the research sides, how we are creating the models, how we're deploying the models is very focused on the audio and figuring out not only now in speech and voices, but how we can enlarge that into the future in other parts of audio, but then building products around it. And th we, we don't see most of those bigger players uh, go into that. I think they are, they are figuring out the basics of the model part, but really not going that, that level deeper in how to build the ecosystem and the product. And then there's a second piece, which is beyond the product element and something that, that we are truly excited about is how can you make this into, into more of the ecosystem collaborative play. As you think about our work, we want to be global. We want to create a technology that carries that nuance of the accent, of the voice across any region that, that you are. And one of the things that we've realized is that people around the world also care about this. As you, as you work with a company in Spain or in Finland, they, they will want to make sure that that nuance is carried across. Uh, so one of the initiatives we, we've done here, uh, which, which may, maybe shows that difference a little bit better, is created a 
a voice library, voice mar marketplace, where everybody can create a voice, share it, and earn money while that voice is being used. In the process now, we have a few thousand voices uh, carrying all different accent variations. Um, so in Spanish, there's a Catalan Spanish, European, Latin American Spanish, which, which is something that we don't see those big companies doing, which allow you to not only use the technology, but really carry that nuance, control that nuance at a different scale. So you're building a moat around this modality. Um, Brian, presumably you think that's the right strategy. Do you, do you th does it keep you up at night, the risk that there's going to kind of one model that rules them all? So I don't know if we talked about it, but our investment memo, risk factor one, mother model, you know? Um, turned out in so far in, in a year and a half to two years, it's untrue. And I think it's the, all the reason why Matty said where this maniacal focus on this modality of audio, and we say audio as if it's like one thing. It's not. Audio is the speech that we are having right now. It's the ambient noise that's going on. Maybe we have a background music at some point. The, the lengths matter, the intonation matter, the, 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 the uh, what, what should we call it? The, um, the speed matters. Like if it's real time, that, that's something else versus like, you know, it takes time. So I think audio as a category is much larger and deeper and much more nuanced than people think is like, oh, it's an audio, like text to speech, done, speech to speech, done. Like that's not actually the sole domain of audio. So I think the team that is focused on all things audio is actually incredibly deep. And if you think about the market of like, oh, like what if the Babel Tower of Babel came down? What is the market size of that? The answer is like, I don't freaking know. Huge. So I think that's like what gives us comfort. And two, because of that focus, the, we're not just thinking about creation, right? That would be a research product. We're really, and through Matty and team, are really thinking about the application of that and how enterprises, individuals can use that, which actually turns into how can this be more useful? Where in the workflow can this fall in? How much more can we own of that? And I think that becomes, over time, a very, very big differentiation. Mm. Matty, on the regulatory front, do you worry that the regulatory hammer is going to come down on this, on this space? Is that, is, that a, is that a risk factor? And how do you think about adjusting to that? The, um, I, I, in general, like at, at our stage, and as you think about it, not, the, not a, a risk factor. We would, we would welcome the same set of, 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 of legal uh, regulatory rules across for, for the companies and are happy to collaborate and, and figure out what those should be for. Yeah. For, for the European ecosystem, for the global ecosystem. Um, so not, not worried, and, and truthfully, as you think about the AI space, there will be new things that emerge and new, the new ways that technology can be used that we need to, that we need to build, build the loss around as well. We've got about a minute left on the clock, so before we go, give us a, give us a, give us a hint of what you and the team are working, working on right now, what we may expect to see from Eleven Labs in the, in the kind of months, months ahead. Brian mentioned that in the investment memo, one of, the, one of the top risks was the, the research thing. We still think this is the top, top risk level um, and, and why we spend so much time over, over now on building on the research side. One of the new things that we are working on is a new generation of our models that will combine a lot of the audio but um, be, be amplified by a lot of things that are possible in the wider LLM space and create effectively an omni experience. So if you are Say narrating an audiobook today, you have a static narration that narrates that book. As you think about the future, you will have different characters narrating different lines. You will have sounds that immerse you into the story, music that plays into the background. So if you hear the thunderstorm, you hear the raindrops. So that's the thing that we are obsessing now. And while it started with dubbing, and we are lucky to, to work with incredible people like Lex Friedman yesterday, releasing his podcast in Spanish. Uh, to, to hopefully wow. thinking how we can bring that Omni experience in the future. Okay, from dubbing to, to the Omni experience. Matty from Eleven Labs, thank you very much indeed. And Brian Kim, of course, from A16Z. Thank you, Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. That was great, thank you. Thank you.